Chapter 2 Orientals and Scythians Scythian Characteristics Manners of Pre-Roman Britons The Pictish Marsh Dwellers The Ogres or White and Black, the Black Huns and Hypotheses The Jews, the Phoenicians, the Chaldees are all stated to have visited our islands at various periods and perhaps to have colonised them. It is the delight of one school of Gaelic writers to discover many affinities between the Hebrew and Gaelic tongues. And assuredly, to a mere layman, these resemblances seem distinct and unmistakable. The Irish name for the golden gorget of the Druids, the Fodan Morain, is identical with the Chaldee name for Urim and Thummim. In short, continues Governor Pownall, Early Irish Antiquities, Archaeologia, Volume 7, my friend the rabbi, Heideck, will have it, that none but Jews or Chaldees could have brought the name and the thing to Ireland. When Martin visited the island of St. Kilda last century, he made the statement that the ancient Hebrew measure of Omer and Cubit continues to be used in this isle. And whatever the fact may be worth, the emblem known as Solomon's seal has been found by Scottish antiquaries upon many a sculptured stone. There seems little doubt that the Phoenicians, at any rate, were here. They, indeed, appear to have been as great navigators as the British ever were. They are said to have crossed the Atlantic and planted a settlement in Florida. They are believed to have sailed far into the eastern seas and to various parts of Africa, and they are admitted to have visited all the western coasts of Europe. And, in the time of Hiram, king of Tyre, to have voyaged far and wide in search of treasure at the bidding of Solomon the Great. They are supposed to have traded at this time with the metal workers of Cornwall, had to have colonised some parts of Ireland, and presumably it was during this period that the seal of Solomon was carved upon the Scottish stones. Some of this is conjecture, some fact. But it is interesting to think of our islands as Orientals and Scythians. At one time the possible dependencies of Solomon's vast empire and it gives him a new and quite friendly character to reflect that, if this were the case, we should have some grounds for imagining that we too may be the posterity of one or other of his very numerous family. But the claims of the Jew and the Phoenician to be regarded as ancient Britons are shadowy though not uncertain. The Scythians, however, have a clearer right to be so regarded, for most antiquaries agree in holding the Scythians as the ancestors of the ancient Britons. The word Scythian is, however, delightfully vague, and is becoming or is already out of date. It was used to include all the nations to the north and east of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, and indeed all the unknown North European races, and some of the philologers derive it from Siotan to shoot, thereby giving it the meaning of bowman or archer, but even as to this there seems to be some difference of opinion. The late Lord Strangford, who is indeed my authority for the derivation just given, says of them, Some of the Scythian peoples may have been Anarian, Allophilic, Mongolian. Some were demonstrably Aryan, and not only that, but Iranian as well, as is best shown in a memoir read before the Berlin Academy this last year. The evidence having been first indicated in the rough, by Schafferich, the Slavonic antiquary. Coins, glosses, proper names and inscriptions prove it. Another writing on this subject says, Ethnographers are not unanimous in respect to the ethnic position of the Scythians. Bork, Nibur and many others set them down as Tatars, but Humboldt, Grimm, Donaldson and others maintain, both on physical and philological grounds, their ethnic affinity with the Aryans. Rawlinson, in his essay, On the ethnic affinities of the nations of Western Asia, Herodotus, Volai, P523, etc., distinctly ranges the Scythians among Tatar nations. He even maintains that a Tatar element is manifest in the oldest records of the Armenians, Cappadocians, Sasanians and Chaldeans of Babylon. In a later essay, On the Ethnography of the European Scythes, Herodotus, Volmbethre, p. 158, he argues as distinctly that this nation was Indo-European, F. Müller is of the opinion that some of the scythes were Ural Altaic and others Aryan, Novara Expedition, Ethnography, Pi 145. It is thus apparent that the term Scythian is too comprehensive to be of much use, and that it is, 
surely a negative rather than a positive term, much like our Indian or the Turanian of modern ethnologists, used to comprehend nomads and barbarians of all sorts and races. Nevertheless, since everyone says that some, at any rate, of the original races of the British islands were Scythians, it behoves us to look a little closer into their history and characteristics. From Lempriere we learn this, the Scythians were divided into several nations or tribes. They had no cities, but continually changed their habitations. They inured themselves to bear labour and fatigue. They despised money, lived upon milk, and covered themselves with the skins of their cattle. He adds that the virtues seemed to flourish among them, but in opposition to this, or more correctly, in support of the statement that the Scythians comprehended several nations or tribes. He goes on to say, Some authors, however, represent them as a savage and barbarous people who fed upon human flesh, drank the blood of their enemies and used the skulls of travellers as vessels in their sacrifices to their gods. The Scythians made several eruptions upon the more southern provinces of Asia, especially BC 624, when they remained in possession of Asia Minor for 28 years and we find them at different periods extending their conquests in Europe and penetrating as far as Egypt. In the first centuries after Christ, they invaded the Roman Empire with the Sarmatians. Of these Sarmatians, evidently a kindred race. Lempriere says that they were a savage, uncivilised nation, often confounded with the Scythians, naturally warlike and famous for painting their bodies to appear more terrible in the field of battle. They were well known for their lewdness and passed among the Greeks and Latins by the name of barbarians. At last, increased by the savage hordes of Scythia, under the barbarous names of Huns, Vandals, Goths, Alans, etc., they successfully invaded and ruined. The empire in the third and fourth centuries of the Christian era. They lived upon plunder and fed upon milk mixed with the blood of horses. These Scythians then, who, under various names and possessed of many different qualities of character and of nature, covered the whole north of Europe and a large portion of Asia in the days of the Romans, seem in the main to identify themselves with the Ugrians spoken of by Mr. Howarth, as quoted in the foregoing chapter. The area in which they dwelt and also their era agree, and the brief descriptions quoted also tally with each other. The chronicler Reginon describes the Hungarians as living by fishing and hunting and as fighting with bows and arrows. That is, according to Lord Strangford, they were scythes. The ancient Hungarians scarified their faces, that is, tattooed themselves, and the Sarmatians are at least said to have painted their bodies. But the connections between the two races, or the same race under different names, are too striking and too numerous to require to be detailed. One of these, the milk diet of Lempriere's Scythians, and the milk and blood of his Sarmatians, stands out clearly if we remember that, not so very long ago, the Basques in Spain and the Finns in Sweden, now mere wrecks and waifs of the original population, were close neighbours. And that about that period, Europe was overrun by fishermen and hunters, such as we find in Siberia, where we ought to go if we are to study the religion, the manners and government of the so-called stonefolk. With this in mind, then, one is not surprised to find that the Konkani, who once occupied the district now known as the Basque provinces, are said to have lived chiefly on milk mixed with horses' blood, or that the Nordenskjöld expedition ascertained that the Siberian tribe of Chukches are exceedingly fond of a soup of which the principal ingredient is seal's blood, and since the voyage of the Vega has thrown considerable light upon the customs of this people, it may not be out of place to quote further from the account thus obtained. In summer, the Chukches cat cloud berries, red bilberries and other berries, which are said to be found in great abundance in the interior of the country. The writers who quote the Chukchis as an example of a race living exclusively on substances derived from the animal kingdom thus commit a complete mistake. On the contrary, they appear at certain seasons of the year to be more graminivorous than any other people I know, and with respect to this their taste appears to me to give the anthropologist a hint of certain traits of the mode of life 
of the people of the Stone Age, which have been completely overlooked. To judge from the Chukches, our primitive ancestors by no means so much resembled beasts of prey as they are commonly imagined to have done. And it may perhaps have been the case that Bellomomnium inter omnis was first brought in with the higher culture of the Bronze or Iron Age. The other descriptions given by the distinguished leader of the expedition relative to the weapons, pottery and general characteristics of this race, through necessarily migre, are full of interest and point in many ways to their ancient kinship with the primitive inhabitants of Britain. The custom of tattooing, for example, which they have inherited from their Scythian ancestors, has also been handed down to us from the same source and can scarcely be said to be yet extinct among us, while the unpleasant chuksh method of warding off or healing the effects of the frost upon the hands is still practised by the Scottish peasantry. And this reminds me that the milk diet of the ancient Scythians and the similar food of the old Basques and the modern Chukches found favour also with that branch of the same people which dwelt in certain parts of Britain at the coming of the Romans, of the Hebrideans of the first century. It was reported that they knew nothing of the cultivation of the ground, but lived upon fish and milk, which latter, adds Mr. Skeen, implies the possession of herds of cattle. Plus, a race of fishermen and hunters, and cattle owners, like the Ugrians of Mr. Howarth and Lempriere's Scythians. The sketch given by the learned author of Celtic Scotland, of the ancient Britons, is so much a picture of the Scythes and Ugars that it may be briefly quoted here. In addition, in addition to what has just been repeated of his account of the Hebrideans, Mr. Skeen says, They had, it was said, one king who was not allowed to possess property, lest it should lead him to avarice and injustice, or a wife, lest a legitimate family should provoke ambition. In short, they, the Romans, learned that there existed among this new people a state of society, similar to that which Caesar reported to have found among the indigenous inhabitants of the interior of Britain. By the interior of Britain is meant the interior, more particularly, of what is now England, but the account which Mr. Skeen gives of the ancient Caledoni will suit the supposed Aborigines of England as well as of the Hebrides. The manners of the two nations, the Caledoni and Meate, two confederacies of all the kindred tribes living in central and north central Scotland at the beginning of the third century, known later on as Picti, are described as the same, and they are viewed by the historians in these respects as if they were but one people. They are said to have neither walls nor cities as the Romans regarded such, and to have neglected the cultivation of the ground. They lived by pasturage, the chase, and the natural fruits of the earth. The great characteristics of the tribes believed to be indigenous were found to exist among them. They fought in chariots, and to their arms of the sword and shield, as described by Tacitus, they had now added a short spear of peculiar construction, having a brazen knob at the end of the shaft, which they shook to terrify their enemies, and likewise a dagger. They are said to have had community of women, and the whole of their progeny were reared as the joint offspring of each small community. And the third great characteristic, the custom of painting the body, attracted particular notice. They are described as puncturing their bodies so as, by a process of tattooing, to produce the representation of animals, and to have refrained from clothing, in order that what they considered an ornament should not be hidden. It may be mentioned also that the nation of the Merte consisted of those tribes which were situated next the wall between the Forth and Clyde on the north. The Caledoni lay beyond them, and Mr. Skeen derives Meata from Gaelic, Mag a plain because this confederacy inhabited the pot plains and marshes, were, in short, lake dwellers. For even although the Roman historian had not said so, it is a geological fact that the level stretch of Carr's land through which the river forth winds was a morass within comparatively recent times, and it may fairly be presumed that the tribes of the Meate dwelt in those pile buildings, known in Scotland and Ireland as Cranages the remains of which are found in great numbers throughout these two countries, as well as in Norfolk, 
and in various other parts of Europe. Although the British Scythians appear as painted or tattooed people from the beginning, they did not receive the general designation of Picti until the 3rd century. So says Innes in his essay on the ancient inhabitants of Scotland. And he adds that the Britons, or Welch, called all these northern people their ancient enemies, Feicht Thed. The existence of great tracts of marshlands is indicated in Pythias, description of Thule, quoted by Strabo. It was neither land, nor sea, nor air separately, but a certain concretion of them all, like sea blubber in which, he says, that land and sea and all things are suspended, and that this is, as it were, the bond, i.e., boundary, of all things, being neither passable by travelling nor by sailing, that he had himself seen the resemblance of this blubber, but that the rest he described by hearsay. Lysons, our British ancestors, Peter II. What part of the British islands Thule was, if any, is, of course, uncertain, but if Ultima Thule was Orkney, Shetland, or the Hebrides, then Scotland seems the likeliest to be Thule itself. The marshes, enveloped in malarial mists, of which Pythaeus speaks so quaintly, seem to have stretched over a great part of Scotland even in the 6th century, for Procopius, writing from Constantinople at that period, describes the districts north of the Forth and Clyde as a region infested by wild beasts and with an atmosphere so tainted that human life could not exist. And Mr. Skeen, from whom I am quoting, adds that Stephanus Byzantinus, writing from the same place half a century earlier, considered Albion to be actually a separate island, while even Gildas, himself of British descent and writing from the neighbouring shore of Armorica, and taking his description of the size of Britain from the cosmogony of Ethicus, written two centuries earlier, evidently considered the country north of the Firths of Forth and Clyde as a separate island from the rest of Britain, an island it could not have been, but the statements here cited seem clearly to argue that this portion of Scotland was narrowed into a mere isthmus about the time of the Roman occupation and the wide expanse of now solid land that lies to the south and east of Aberfoyle was then a fen district, with here and there islands of firm ground on which were situated the villages of the Meate, built upon pile-supported platforms, as in the Malian archipelago at the present day, or more solidly of stone, as in the orthodox British Cranoge. The Saxons named them Pelts or Peters, and the Irish and ancient Scots expressed the same thing in equivalent terms of their language, calling them Kruthnik, from Kruth, which signifies forms or figures, such as they used to paint or mark on themselves. The same writer, whose essay is characterised by Mr Skeen as admirable and regarded by him as of real importance, decides that the various tribes of the Picti found the northern parts of the island as yet uncultivated and void of inhabitants when they came in. As to the place from whence they came, there is some difference of opinion. Innes concludes that it was Gaul, and that the Picti and the Britons were of the same original stock. He also cites the conjectures of Tacitus and of Bede, the first bringing them from Germany, and the second from Scythia, but, as he pertinently observes, the same place is understood by both, for Tacitus called all northern Europe Germania Magna, while Bede included among Scythians the ancient inhabitants of Norway, Sweden and Denmark, the Dachi, Gete and other nations. And he further states that the first Roman writers who speak of these northern nations mention their custom of painting and tattooing their bodies with particular emblems. Among these tribes are the Arii, the Agatirsi, the Geloni and the Gete, described by Tacitus and also by Solinus. In the same terms as the Kruthnik or Picti of Ireland and Scotland, Buchanan states that the Britons, the Arii in Germany and the Agathirsi painted their bodies, but that the Picts, specially so-called, marked their skins with iron and delineated the figures of different animals upon them. He also quotes Claudian to show that the tribes of the Galoni and the Geta tattooed themselves in the same way. The first named are described as 66, the Galoni 
who delight their hardy limbs with iron to imprint, and of the others it is said. The nobles of the long-haired Gaeta sat in council, skin-clad, and their bodies bore the seamy ornament of many a scar. This Geti then resembled strongly the fur-clad Scarifid Hungarians or Ugris of whom Mr. Howarth has written, and they were likely enough akin to each other. The Geloni, who, it is seen, were accustomed to tattoo their bodies, were also used to paint them, for they are one with the Agathirsi. Mr. Skeen facts in view, one would naturally argue that these latter tribes arrived in this country from North Europe rather than from Gaul, but perhaps the real explanation of such apparent incongruities is to be found in the probable fact that this tattooed Ugrian race occupied at the date under discussion a great part of its old territories in Gaul and Hispania. Whatever may be the antecedents of the yellow-haired, white-skinned Xantacroy, it is clear that this totally different Ugrian race is the chief one to be considered in dwelling upon the Europe of two thousand years ago. If it really did about that epoch occupy, if not a ring round the world, at least one reaching from Britain to Kamskatka. It must be remembered that a very great element in the Celtic, Latin and Greek languages has been shown to be Ugrian, and that, apart from linguistic connection, more than one scholar has ascertained the existence of a large Turanian admixture among the ancient Romans, as well as among the present Negro populations of northern Africa. Perhaps the word mongoloid, as expressing affinity with Mongolians without implying identification, is the most comprehensive and therefore the most suitable term to use when speaking of a period so remote. These Ugrians are all the more interesting to us, because they have been identified with the ogres of our nursery tales, therein described as a race of cruel, anthropophagous tyrants, against whom our forefathers, or at least the forefathers of some of us, fought a stubborn and eventually a winning fight. The name, Hungarian, is another form of the word. The Ungri and Ungari of the Western writers and the Uigroi of the Byzantines are both derived from the Slavic Ugri. Ugri is the form in Nestor, Uri, Wegri, when his Celtic Scotland, Van Valeind, Pina 175, says that these Agathirsi were, according to Irish tradition, the Cruthni, or Picts, who settled in Ireland, that they were the children of Galonus, whence Galoni, son of Hercules, that they came from the land of Thrace, passed through France, where they built the city of Pictavis, and that they then crossed over to Ireland, where they received an offer of a district from the king of Linster, on condition that they would drive out a people called the Tuatha Fidbe, which they did. From this tribe, then assuming the truth of the tradition, might be derived the Saflat Tartar faces, observed by Thackeray and Wengri and other authors. The same authority states that Constantine Porphyrogenitus tells us the Hungarians, by him called Turks, formerly dwelt near the Chazars, in a place called Lebedius, settlement between the Volga River and the Urals. The mountains were named after their founder. Then, he says, they were not called Turks but Sabatoyasvali. Zeus ingeniously conjectures that the first syllables are equivalent to the German swart, schwarz and black, and that the whole word is a translation of the Slavic Czerny Ugri, Black Ugri, by which the Hungarians are known in later Russian writers. White and black, as is well known, means, with Eastern writers, little more than dominant and dependent. Thus the black Khazars, or Hungarians, were the subjects of the white Khazars. Now, before going further, it is necessary to look into this last statement pretty closely. For the origin of this nomenclature may be found to lie very deep. I find it stated elsewhere that the Tatarian tribes are very fond of expressing by certain colours the changes of political condition to which a nation may be subjected. Black or Kara has the meaning of dependency and servitude, while white or Ak has that of sovereignty and freedom. But these colours are employed only so long as they really describe the position of a tribe, for if a dependent horde becomes independent and sovereign, the former Kara or black will be changed into Ak or white. The Tatars, to whom the mighty conqueror Chinggis Khan belonged, 
were named before his time Kara Tatars, while another tribe was called Ak Tatars or White Tatars. This is also the reason why the Emperor of Russia is called the White Tsar, and the divisions of Russia into white and black express the same meaning. But this custom is not confined to Asia and the east of Europe. It obtains, or did obtain in Britain as well, and, like the word, Kara. This word Kara is an example of the Ugrian element in Celtic speech. In Gaelic it is Kiar, which is spelled Kar, Kari, Ker, Kar, and Ker in modern Scottish surnames, all of which are simply Kiar. The final way of the slower-speaking Mongoloids has dropped off, but the word is the same. It now means swarthy, or dark brown, rather than black, which signification attaches more distinctly to the word dub as in Dublin. Kara itself has plainly an Ugrian origin. It still survives in the word blackguard, which, though now applied very loosely, is more strictly defined by Halliwell as meaning a nickname given to the lowest drudges of the court, the carriers of coal and wood, the labourers in the scullery, etc. Its Scotch form, Black Ward, is given by Dr. Jameson as a state of servitude to a servant, in support of which he quotes Ritchie Moniplies. So that you see, sir, I hold in a sort of black ward tenure, as we call it in our country, being the servant of a servant. Jameson also says that a black is a vulgar designation for a low scoundrel, corresponding in censor to the English blackwood. While in Halliwell's dictionary I find black tan, stated to be a term you said in speaking of gypsies in Kent, and perhaps elsewhere. The same thing is seen in Scottish Gaelic. A girl of the lowest rank of peasantry is a dubchele, black hussy. A strolling female or gypsy is a dubshublach, black vagrant. And Armstrong also gives an obsolete word, duib herach, in Irish Gaelic, duib hertha, as signifying the vernacular. It is perhaps from a like custom that we ought to trace our word, sir. Klaproth says that in the Vogel dialect and in Western Siberian, Sar, Sarni, Sorni, and Siran mean white. In many Samoyeda compounds, the same word is found as Sir, Sir, and Siri. This is Welsh Sir, English Sir, and although AK does not exist in our language, this equivalent has taken its place, just as Kara or Kiar has been pushed aside by Dub. But the result is the same. In this country, as in the East, a word meaning white is attached to the ruling class, and black is synonymous with dependency and servitude. The reason of this is not far to seek, although now used without the sleetest reference to the complexion of either caste. The words assert themselves, as distinctly as words can, to be survivals of a period of white conquest, when a black was a serf. Just as that word and slave may be, and are derived from conquered Serbs and Slavs, even at the present day, white, in American slang, has the idea of high qualities attached to it, though in this case it is likely that the usage started afresh with the practice of Negro slavery in modern times. As the result of this digression then, we have found that all over the north of Europe and of Asia there are word tokens of the presence of Professor Huxley's Australioids at some unascertained date, and the presumption is that they were finally subjugated by the white race. Let us return to the Hungarians or Ugrians. Speaking of the black and white Ugars of Nestor, the former of whom were the Hungarians or Magyars, Mr. Howarth states that they correspond also, as I believe, to the black and white Huns of other writers. This race then, known to themselves as Magyars, Mogeri, according to the notary of Bela, who also gives the forms Deutomoga and Hetumoga, and to others as Turks, Sabartoyasfali, Czerny Ugri or Black Ugri, Ugris or Ogres are to be identified with the Black Huns. Now this fact is important because it brings us face to face with a large and important nation of, say, Scythians, who were not only styled our Black, but who actually were so, and therefore, knowing how numerous they were and how they spread themselves like a flood over Europe, it is to them we must look if we want to learn something of the history and manners of what may be called 
the maternal ancestors of the Melanocroi. Not that they constitute the whole of this branch of the pedigree, but plainly they form a considerable part of it, if they left descendants as numerous or half as numerous as themselves. They are called in Latin Huni and in Greek Uni and Chunwa. Ptolemy speaks of a people of Sarmatia named Chuni who are, I fancy, the same. Lempriere's account of the Sarmatians was, it will be remembered, that they were a savage, uncivilized nation, often confounded with the Scythians, naturally warlike, and famous for painting their bodies to appear more terrible in the field of battle. They were well known for their lewdness, and passed among the Greeks and Latins by the name of barbarians, at last increased by the savage hordes of Scythia, under the barbarous names of Huns, Vandals, Goths, Alans, etc. They successfully invaded and ruined the empire in the 3rd and 4th centuries of the Christian era. They lived upon plunder and fed upon milk mixed with the blood of horses. As described by Reginon, they also lived by fishing and hunting and fought with bows and arrows, and they tattooed their faces in addition to painting themselves. Such Scythians, it was also noticed, inhabited the Basque provinces the Western Islands, and the interior of Scotland and apparently the interior of England also, at the date of the Roman invasion, and the ancestral habits are still, to some extent, kept up by that section of the race now inhabiting northern Siberia. All these people were closely allied by many characteristics, the most striking of which gave rise to the nickname applied to the division who lived in Britain, but which might have as suitably attached itself to all the other branches of the race for all were, in effect, Picti. But it is that division known as Huns, and more especially as Black Huns, that we are at present to consider. Let me transcribe a brief history of this people. The Huns were of Asiatic origin, and, in all probability, of the Mongolian or Tartar stock, therefore akin to, and perhaps to be identified with, the Scythians and Turks. According to Deginius, whose theory has been accepted by Gibbon, the Huns who invaded the Roman Empire were lineally descended from the Heongnu, whose ancient seat was an extensive but barren tract of country immediately to the north of the Great Wall of China. About the year 200 BC, these people overran the Chinese Empire, defeated the Chinese armies in numerous engagements, and even drove the Emperor Kaoit himself to an ignominious capitulation and treaty. During the reign of Wu Ti, 141-87 BC, the power of the Huns was very much broken. Eventually, they separated into two distinct camps, one of which, amounting to about 50,000 families, went southwards, while the other endeavored to maintain itself in its original seat. This, however, it was very difficult for them to do, and eventually the most warlike and enterprising went west and northwest in search of new homes. Of those that went northwest, a large number established themselves for a while on the banks of the Volga. Then, crossing this river, they advanced into the territories of the Alani, a pastoral people dwelling between the Volga and the Don. At what period this took place is uncertain, but probably it was early in the 4th century. The Alani, who had long dwelt in these plains, the Black Huns. Thirty-five resisted the incursions of the Huns with much bravery and some effect, until at length a bloody and decisive battle was fought on the banks of the Don, in which the Allen King was slain and his army utterly routed. The vast majority of the survivors joined the invaders. The Huns are described as being of a dark complexion, almost black, deformant in their appearance, of uncouth gesture and shrill voice. They were distinguished, says Gibbon, from the rest of the human species by their broad shoulders, flat noses, and small black eyes deeply buried in the head, and as they were almost destitute of beards, they never enjoyed either the manly graces of youth or the venerable aspect of age. A fabulous origin was assigned worthy of their form and manners, that the witches of Scythia, who for their foul and deadly practices had been driven from society, had copulated in the desert with infernal spirits, and that the Huns were the offspring of this execrable conjunction. Such was the origin assigned to them by their enemies, the Goths, whom the Huns now invaded with fire and sword. Hermanric, the aged sovereign of the Goths, whose dominions reached from the Baltic to the Euxine, 
roused himself to meet the invaders, but in vain. His successor, Withamir, encountered the Huns in a pitched battle, in which he himself was slain, and his countrymen utterly routed. These now threw themselves upon the protection of the Emperor Valens, who in 376 gave permission to a great number of them to cross the Danube and settle in the countries on the other side as auxiliaries to the Roman arms against further invasion. The Huns now occupied all the territories that had been abandoned by the Goths, and when these, not long afterwards, revolted against Valens, the Huns also crossed the Danube and joined their arms to those of the Goths in hostilities against the Roman Empire. In the wars that followed, the Huns were not so conspicuous as the Goths their former enemies. Indeed, we now hear but little of the Huns during the remainder of the 4th century. It is supposed, however, that early in the following century they were joined by fresh hordes of their brethren, a circumstance which encouraged them to press onwards towards further conquests. In the reign of Theodosius the Younger, they had increased so considerably in power that their sovereign Rugilas, or Roas, was paid an annual tribute to secure the Roman Empire from further injury. Rugilas, dying in the year 434, was succeeded in the sovereignty of the Huns by his nephews Attila and Bleda. With Attila's death, however, in 454, the power of the Huns was broken in pieces. A few feeble sovereigns succeeded to him, but there was strife now everywhere among the several nations that had owned the firm sway of Attila, and the Huns especially never regained their power. Many of them took service in the armies of the Romans, and others again joined fresh hordes of invaders from the north and east, aiding them in their repeated attacks upon the moribund Roman Empire. Of Attila himself it is said that he, a Hun of the royal blood and in 434 AD succeeded his uncle Roas as chief of countless hordes scattered over the north of Asia and Europe. His brother Bleda, or Blödel, who shared with him the supreme authority over all the Huns, was put to death by Attila in 444 or 445 AD. The Huns regarded Attila with superstitious reverence and Christendom with superstitious dread as the scourge of God. It was believed that he was armed with a supernatural sword, which belonged to the Scythian god of war, which must win dominion over the whole world. It is not known when the name Scourge of God was first applied to Attila. He is said to have received it from a hermit in Gaul. The whole race of Huns was regarded in the same light. The Vandals, Ostrogoths, Gepidi, and many of the Franks fought under his banner and in a short time his dominion extended over the people of Germany and Scythia, i.e. from the frontiers of Gaul to those of China. In 451 Attila turned his course to the west to invade Gaul, but was here boldly confronted by Aetius, leader of the Romans, and Theodoric, king of the Visigoths, who compelled him to raise the siege of Orleans. These two generals finally defeated him with great slaughter, near the site now occupied by the city of Chalons surname. This, if old historians are to be trusted, must have been the most sanguinary battle ever fought in Europe, for it is stated by contemporaries of Attila that not less than 252,000 or 300,000 slain were left on the field. Attila, having retired within his camp of wagons, collected all the wooden shields, saddles and other baggage into a vast funeral pile resolving to die in the flames rather than surrender. But by the advice of Aetius, the Roman general, the Huns were allowed to retreat without much further loss, though they were pursued by the Franks as far as the Rhine. Two years later he died suddenly on the eve of another invasion of Italy. His death spread consternation through the host of the Huns. His followers cut themselves with knives, shaved their heads and prepared to celebrate the funeral rites of their king. It is said that his body was placed in three coffins, the first of gold, the second of silver, and the third of iron, that the caparison of his horses with his arms and ornaments were buried with him, and that all the captives who were employed to make his grave were put to death, so that none might betray the resting place of the king of the Huns. The name of this powerful monarch, who ruled over an empire as extensive as any on record, is said to be the same as the Hungarian Ethel which is understood to be a title of honour, and is apparently no other than Saxon Ethel and German Adele noble.
like Kara, black. It may be taken as an example of an Ugrian word in a non-Ugrian or partly Ugrian language, and in both cases the final A of the slow-speaking mongoloid, a mere after-breathing or drawl, has been dropped by the borrowers. Of his physical appearance it is said that he possessed the Mongolian characteristics low stature, a large head, with small, brilliant, deep-seated eyes and broad shoulders. From the sketch just quoted, of Attila or Ethel and his race, and also from the preceding remarks, the following inferences may be drawn. 1. That the Picti of the Hebrides and of other districts of Britain and Ireland have many points in common with the Mongoloid Picti, who were their contemporaries, and who covered an immense area of Asia and Europe, and that although the British Picti have not been proved to be of similar complexion to the black-skinned Huns or Ogres who constituted a large section of the Asiatic Picti, yet there is word, evidence in our islands, as elsewhere, of a time when a conquered race was of black colour. 2. That, assuming the historical sketch just quoted to be exact, the Hayong Nu, Huns or Ogres, who separated into two bands about the beginning of the Christian era, the one going southward from their point of departure, the outskirts of China, and the other west and northwest, eventually branching also into the countries bordering the Mediterranean, coincide in almost every respect with the Mongoloids of Professor Huxley, marked 8b upon his map, who inhabit the vast territory, which lies mainly to the east of a line drawn from Lapland to Siam and are figured as men who are short and squat, with the skin of a yellow-brown colour, the eyes and hair black and the latter. Straight, coarse and scanty on the body and face, but long on the scalp. This general division of Mongoloids reaches as far south as the southmost islands of the Malayan archipelago, and takes in the Malays proper, and I suspect the indigenous people of the Philippines who are not Negritos, and this may be reasonably supposed to be the result of the southward movement of the 50,000 Hun families in or about the first century of our era. The position of the European branch of this Mongoloid race, according to Professor Huxley, agrees also, in the main, with that of those Huns who spread themselves over the greater part of Europe during the 3rd, 4th and 5th centuries. 3. And as that division which included the Black Ogres, Huns or Chazars is described as almost black, in complexion, it is evident we have in them an element more akin to the now extinct Tasmanians, who, it may be remembered, were of a dark brown colour or nearly black, were of moderate stature and robust frame, as the black Huns were, and who also were Picti, both as regards painting and tattooing, as were the Huns also. These Tasmanians have, it has been noted, stone circles and cairns in the country which they inhabited, and in this particular, not the only one, strongly resemble the Picti of Britain. The Negrito race, to whom the Tasmanians belong, are marked on Professor Huxley's map as occupying New Caledonia, New Guinea, and some of the islands to the east of it, including part of Fiji, the interior of Lower Siam, the Andaman Islands, and, of course, Tasmania. They present a remarkable approximation to the Australioid type, the most marked points of resemblance being apparently the heavy brow ridges and sharply pentagonal skull, and the chief differences being that the Negrito's hair is woolly, while that of the Australioid is wavy and silky, and the skin of the latter is a shade of chocolate brown, and, therefore, not so dark as the Negrito's. Making allowance, then, for various crossings with different varieties of men, during a period of about 2,000 years it may be conjectured that among the southward-moving Huns, as among those who came into Europe, there was a considerable body of black people, akin to the Australioids, that they were the authors of the stone circles and cairns of Tasmania and of Borneo, which island they may first have settled in, that they formed the bulk of the inhabitants of Australia, and also of the Negrito Islands becoming fused with slightly different races, and that the stone circles and cairns of northwestern Europe were, like those of the Antipodes, the work of Negrito Australioid people, such as those whose skulls were found in Caithness, and who were identical with, or ancestors of, the Black Huns of European history.